Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Steven Siwak. Steve is a senior mechanical design engineer at Quick Pouch, a company that makes the machines that make pouches quickly. Steve, welcome to the pod. Thank you, Spencer. It's great to be back. So I'm going through some of our notes here, and I see um, from the McLaren years, um, is it Blenheim Giboa? Yeah, Blenheim Gilboa. What is that? Because I feel like we is, talked about the car thing, so I'd be curious to... Okay, the, the, the Blenheim, Blenheim Gilboa is in upstate New York in Blenheim, uh, Blenheim Gilboa. Yeah. Uh, and it's a power storage facility. It doesn't generate power from fossil fuels or solar or wind. What it does is it takes power from the grid and it there's a there's a lake at the bottom of the cliff and there's a man-made lake at the top of the cliff huh and it pumps water during the evening when rates are low interesting in from the bottom lake to the top lake and stores it there until it's needed generates over 1100 megawatts of electricity but that's all through gravitational potential energy and hydroelectric. Yes. Yeah, that's so interesting. It, so it costs money to build this thing, and it costs money to pump all the water up. But but you're exploiting it, arbitrage across different times of day, and that yes, somehow makes exactly. more money than the losses you get due to inefficiencies and in pumping. That's interesting. Or evaporation exactly. or any of that crap. Right. You have evaporation, you have inefficiency in pumping, you have inefficiency of converting the, the water flow back into electricity. Yep. You have the cost to build the plant, you have the cost to maintain the plant and all the other subsequent costs. Even with all those costs all together, they make money or they wouldn't huh. do it. That's interesting. They make money because of the price difference from the cost of energy during the day when usage demands a higher usage can demand a higher cost and during the evening when all the businesses are closed and the the power requirements drop so then you the said cost it generates 10 megawatts at peak it generates over 1100 megawatts wait 11 a, a gigawatt 1.1 gigawatts as Doc <laughs> they Brown back to the future yeah uh 1.1 gigawatts of electricity <laughs> gigawatts. But the problem was they had they had to inspect the penstock they had to inspect this vertical shaft which was why is it called a penstock i wonder uh it's it's it's, it's part of what uh it's a, it's a word that is used by uh hydroelectric people okay that's outside my domain so i don't feel bad yeah about uh, it. it's, it's just at the edge of mine because i'm i'm uh yeah uh this the pens here, here i'm uh, pen stock is the right word uh there we go i i found the link uh i'll send it to you so you you can include it in the in the discussion sure it's a thousand foot tall and 15 feet in diameter and it's brick line so it's because it resembles a pen in some regard i i i'm going to assume that it's 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 originally welsh and its origin and i don't know where the hell it yeah, comes fair from. enough all right I, I just i don't know and that's okay yeah so but they needed to inspect it they needed to inspect the inner surface of the pen stock and it's a thousand foot long tube yeah. lined with bricks for the entire length bricks and concrete are some mix of, of the above and it was well before drones were a thing huh so 
Interior, exterior. I, interior. Okay, that's interesting. So, it and it, it's like a, the upper lake, which is man-made. It's like a giant bathtub. There's a drain in it. Yeah. And it's covered by a concrete cap, and there are side ports in the drain so that the water can get through and be relatively unrestricted or give you whatever full laminar flow you need to have vertically in your penstock to drive the turbines down at the base as yeah. it goes back into the natural, I'll assume, a natural lake at the at the bottom of this cliff, the yeah. thousand foot drop. So somehow or other, Mal McLaren knew a guy who knew a guy who was looking to get this penstock inspected. And McLaren got the award. And we McLaren just got on board uh, an electrical engineer. One of the few times we had an electrical engineer, Paul Stoltenberg, uh, who's now uh, running a scene shop up in Connecticut. When you say uh, a scene shop, you mean like... Showman, for... fabri you know, showman fabricators, I think. Uh, very much like when, I, when I've talked about scenic technologies... Uh, they do uh, technical uh, machinery for Broadway. Got related it. Okay, shows. yeah. So it's what it sounds like. They're making scenes yeah. for plays. And I believe it's Showman Fabricators up in Connecticut. Yeah. Uh, and so Paul just had come on board. Uh, show motion. Yes, I don't want to get this wrong. So he had just come on board. And so we had just won this contract. It was really auspicious timing. Uh, so... I said, let's let's make an imperial droid. Remember the uh, imperial droid in I know it's the, the Star you know, Wars, but I don't Star know Wars. what it is. On, on, on Hoth, this 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 green thing pops its head up behind a snowy mountain, and it says something like "bees in a pea pod, bees in a pea pod," and it looks left and right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember that. I said, we're gonna. I told him, I said, we're gonna make one of those. It's gonna have an Nuktun, I N U K T U N camera on its base hanging below it like what a pedunkle. What does that refer to? It's a, it's a two-axis ball turret camera. Huh. Uh, it's, it's a visual light infrared and infrared camera, if I'm remembering correctly. And it's waterproof. Why do you need infrared on, for, for what you're doing? Because we didn't... Uh, I don't remember what we had for a light source. Huh. Uh, but uh, it might have been visual visual light. But that was suspended from the bottom of our Imperial inspection droid. We had a bunch of, we surrounded the perimeter of the droid, which is maybe around two and a half, three feet in diameter. Uh, I can picture that. With Polaroid type uh, distance sensors. How did and you so keep those it, sealed against water? Because I feel like those things probably wouldn't I be think great getting splashed. I, if I'm remembering correctly, and this is over 20 this years ago. This must have been yeah. late 90s with the tech you're describing. Yeah. Okay. And so, so we had that, and there may have been one or, uh, one or two other instruments. We had a P, if I remember, a PLC on board, and then it draped an electrical cable up the line. Oh, that's cool. Uh, again, a, a, a thousand feet plus whatever service loop we needed. We had a specialty uh, reel for that with slip rings on it huh. so that we could pay out a thousand foot of this line. Uh, and then we had three servo-controlled stage winches, which we, and, and bless Scenic Technologies part for this, we rented custom winches. That's interesting. Yeah, Scenic made these winches out of ex existing parts and designs, but custom-built for this application. So three winches with over a 1,000-foot capability. And so you've got like a delta configuration between the three in order to steer it. Yeah. So it we 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 really didn't have the ability to move it laterally. We we couldn't puppeteer it like that. But we did want to be able to keep it purely vertical, even if our system wasn't perfectly balanced. Oh, I so, see. So you you pay it out at the same time in order to pay it out at the same time, yeah. uh, and every hundred or every ten or fifteen feet, or however long a a, a distance we made. So those winches first. must have had cable on them, and then you had a separate uh, control line and power line. It sounds like running right, through the, the center. The winch ran steel wire rope. Okay. You know, wire steel ropes, wire rope, um, and we had a separate measurement to make sure that we were measuring the true distance that was being paid out, 
and every 10 feet or 15 feet where we'd have another measurement station that we determined or working with Blenheim Gilboa that we all determined, we'd make sure that the system would do a local level. It. So oh, we dropped it. Oh, shoot. So it must we, have it must have had communication between that that center cable and and the winches somehow yes, through something. Yes, because we had that was one of the other pieces of instrumentation we had on board digital inclinometers. Oh, that's interesting. So we would get to a station, we would pay attention to the feedback from the digital inclinometers, we'd level out the three winches, leveling out the imperial inspection droid. Uh, scan all around, take our pictures, record all the imagery, send it back up the line to, you know, a fixed position on land, and then lower it down. Well, that's kind interesting. Of so you were, you were very incremental with this effort. I mean, like, you go down, you look around, you don't have a fish eye, so you're reliant on that pan tilt unit. Yeah. Do you have yep, zoom capability? Hmm? Do you have zoom capability on that? or is I that... don't recall if we did. Yeah. The thing is, after, after the project, and you're all, got, sorry, ahead. I was going to say you're all electrical. You're not fiber optic on your controls for that. Correct. That's interesting. I'm, I'm 99 plus percent sure there was no I fiber optic. I believe you. I've, just, I've seen similar things more recently with fiber optics. It's just kind of fun to think where oh. the tech's gone and come from. Yeah, I, I, I think the, the, the real, if I'm remembering correctly, the, the, the real for the electrical cable was also custom built, but it was... It was by a company that does that. We just had to specify it unique to our application. Um, again, because a thousand feet is a hell of a long payout. Well, and I would imagine with the slip rings, you had some um, signal issues that you had to rectify somehow, unless you had yeah. like a wireless transmitter somewhere in the loop. Yeah, wi wireless wasn't doing it at the yeah. at that point in history. Huh. So you uh, must have had issues with brushes and spark gaps that you had to contend with with your signal okay. to noise. We Probably use signal grade, which is like a, a silver graphite uh, and possibly gold coating on the slip rings to make sure that we get high quality signals. Uh, I Also, we were, I believe we were, we also took advantage of the fact that we were retrieving information when we weren't moving. That's really interesting. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. But after the project, we... We, we returned the winches to Scenic, and I'm sure they disassembled them for their component parts and used them in other shows after that. But McLaren kept the droid. Huh. It was hanging up. McLa McLaren Engineering um, has a number of different divisions uh, in it. One of them is a dive division. They have scuba divers certified in scuba diving, but also licensed professional engineers, hmm. which is the real reason why Mal McLaren started that company. He he did it because he want and and I and, and he, he's a genius for this. He did it because he wanted an excuse to get paid to be an engineer and a diver. Huh. So he instant he created McLaren Engineering and I'm not sure of this, but I wouldn't be surprised if the dive division wasn't the first division. So in the building that they had in West Nyack, and they've since moved to New Jersey, but there was a, uh, a garage area where, where the dive crew kept their stuff. And hanging from the rafters in the diver's garage was the droid. And it, was, it hung there for years. And when uh, I left the company, I'm very sure it was still hanging there. And I don't know if they took it with them when they moved, but uh, it, it was the, the camera, the Anuktun camera was, was a beautiful piece of work. I'm not sure if they're still in business. I think they may have been absorbed by another company. The product is still around. That's interesting. But uh, that, that was fun. That was one of the- That sounds like the sort of thing Flair would buy. <laughs> <laughs> <It's like a laughs> it was it was one of the McLaren actually had something built because McLaren normally just does design work and other people build it and assemble it and install it. For when we had worked on car, McLaren didn't do a single bit of fabrication. The most we did was we had one of our lead engineers on site 
to sort of project manage or assistant project manage the overall assembly of the components we worked on, which is yeah. a lot of stuff, but McLaren didn't build anything. I doubt he, he spun a wrench. With this Imperial inspection droid, we, we built it in, in McLaren's offices and tested it out and ran practice runs with it. And it was one of the few times it might have been, I think it was the only time I can, it's the only time I can recall where we built the thing ourselves that we had designed. Cool. And it worked. It worked very nicely. We had Scenic uh, fabricate the pieces for us. But I think we did all the assembly. It was simple construction because uh, no, nobody had to look at it. It didn't have to look elegant. It just had to hold up and had to work, which it did. But, uh, yeah, I think we... I mean, protecting we against that parts. kind of moisture ingress isn't easy, though. Like, that's probably well, easier it, said than done. The inspection took place over the course of a week, probably not even a week. Yeah. And the, the thing is the pet stock, pen stock, sorry, was dry. Oh, probably. I see. Yeah, we're not, we weren't going into water. We were going into an empty... Okay, that changes side. things. I assumed there was like water all around. Sorry, you're, you're, you, you made a good assumption, but but that wasn't what we had done. Okay. But it was still very moist and clammy and high humidity. Yeah, but not. Well, we the weren't Polaroid going sensors. Water. I don't even know how those do. Like if they they're submerged or or pretty moist. Like I've never... I, I don't, I don't think they'd have the energy to move water. They yeah. they might give you information over a one foot range. You would have to scale it. Yeah. And that's being optimistic. Yeah, not to mention, like, I feel like the the way those things hook up, if they got wet, like, you know, they they boards would crap out pretty quick. Yeah, or, or your if your transducers got wet, your frequencies would change, and you'd get inaccurate results. Something probably, yeah, because it's a, it's a piezo uh, transducer yeah. to to give yeah. you your your sonic signal. Yeah, yep, yep. So you 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 put a drop of water on it. Maybe maybe it atomizes the moment you fire it up, but I doubt it. I mean, those things yeah. were never like very powerful. I mean, they were yeah. they were like the distance sensor back in the day, but right. hobbyist stuff. Yeah, hobbyist stuff for sure. But like you also saw them on like a lot of academic robots. Like there's a bunch of stuff at Carnegie Mellon um, from the '90s that has those mm -hmm. mounted all over it. You know? Yeah. Now everybody just uses connects. They buy them at, in from surplus houses and just wire them up i imagine when you say connects k-i-n-e-x isn't that the from uh microsoft uh xbox isn't in, in oh, the connect. I mean, those, were, those were in maybe like i feel like that was like 10 years ago that those were maybe five years ago that those were yeah. like pretty popular but i think um for distance measurement i mean it depends what you're measuring like lidar is pretty popular now you can use radar, um, and there's a bunch of like automotive grade radar. Um, you can still use sonar, but it's just different. Like mm -hmm. Pepperell and Fuchs makes a pretty nice sonar sensor for like two, three hundred bucks. Okay, um, I don't know. there's there's a bunch of stuff, but the Polaroids yeah. have been out for a while. I know. Probably if they were still uh, a company, they'd still be making something in that in that area. But then the Connect has been sort of replaced by like the Intel RealSense and. More recently, like the Z cam. Okay. And there's a bunch of stereo cam offerings, but I mean, I feel like the kind of crap you'd get on the lenses in that environment wouldn't be conducive to. Well, I guess you could you could put it behind an aperture and and like send nitrogen around it or something, but. Oh, but but so I can buy as a hobbyist, or even one day better than a hobbyist, a stereo. A, a stereo camera, twin lenses, twin sensors, and the processors are such that for a reasonable price, they will give me a depth map for an yeah. image. So, like, I, I mean, it's been a while since I've been in the market for anything like this, but like, I've got a bunch of Intel Real Senses like mm -hmm. sitting around. Um, and I mean, I think they cost like under $200 when I bought them, like maybe wow. three years ago. And it, it's because they've got an application specific integrated circuit uh, that gets the price way down. Uh, so they, they made a chip just for processing stereo camera streams. Okay. Um, and then 
it's actually three cameras. So there's there's a RGB camera, and then there's two. I think they're black and white stereo cameras, and then there's a little projector that does like a structured light thing. Um, oh, okay. And so when you're outdoors, you rely on the stereo cameras because the uh, structured light projection gets washed out by the UV of the sun. When you're indoors, um, you can use the structured light and have less ambiguity because I think with the stereo cameras, sometimes they get confused as to, you know, what's going on. But I, I, it's been a while since I've messed around with any of that stuff, to be honest. Yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a little rusty. I was at a company for a while, Easy Aerial, uh, an interesting startup at Brooklyn Navy Yards. Who? Oh, that's a cool spot. They, yeah, it was fascinating to work there. Um, but they work on drones, typically your hexacopters. Uh, but it's all they're in a uh, primarily an Israeli firm, but they're not a Chinese firm. I what mean, do you mean by that? the the DJI the DJI drones that are all the rage, yeah, and that have a huge feature set and and very cost effective for their feature set. They're made in China, and I think it's a legitimate fear is that. With these drones and their Chinese chipsets, you don't know where the data you're recording is going. And a lot of these drones communicate wirelessly over whatever RF paths they can to get you your information back to your controller and your video viewer and all the rest of it. And if the U.S. Army or a governmental agency like a, a fire department or the police or whoever needs to do drone work for inspection. Yeah. In the US, they are not allowed to use, for instance, DJI drones. That's interesting. Because the data you you don't have a good sense of security with where your data is going. Yeah. And so right. you're blocked from buying them if you want to use it for one of these applications. Um, the idea is like the U.S. government doesn't want the Chinese government knowing where their infrastructure is. Right, right. Yeah. Because that information might, you know, you you lose control of it once you once you give it off to these drones and their and their and their chips. So uh, Easy Aerial went and filled a niche, and they do as as with any smart company, they try to to have a, a common bait, you know, a, a common design. They have three or four common designs for their drones. So they and were then they Israeli, do... but they had an office in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they, had, they had a couple of offices throughout the world, but it was all all worked out and all cleared. Uh, it's just they had one. Oh, where, where do they have it? Uh, in 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 Europe, they had another programming office in Europe. Uh, you know, where the programmers did their work. I saw those work. guys at a trade show recently in D.C. Um, and I thought of you actually. You should have, because I worked for there for a couple of months. Yeah, I'm aware. <laughs> uh, but they uh, they were looking to add a feature that, again, they don't do the the, the volume of sales that DJI does, because they have a different because uh, they have a different market. Yeah, uh, Easy Arrow has a different market. It's much more restricted. The drones are also higher cost, but it's all it's all interwoven. They'd have you, to be to cover their non-recurring engineering, not at those right. quantities. Right. Yeah. That, that and that's just it. If, if at, at some point they may find a way to, to change their their target audience and go into mass production and lower their prices and go into more mass production, but for now I they have the aerials. Whole thing was that they could set up like an antenna quickly by. They, their drone. their thing is their their big thing is drone in a box. So okay, so it's just like a DJI alternative that's meant to be like you know, yeah, safe data wise. Yeah. The, the, the closer you get to a sort of a government op, a government or a government adjacent operation, the more you want to go towards easy aerial, and they have they have competitors, but I don't have to mention them. Uh, the closer you want to get to easy aerial, okay. the further away you want to get from DJI, because you're you have you need to have control of your data. You need to know where it's going. You need to make sure that it's not going outside of your your environment. Yeah. So one of the problems we had with uh, I had I had worked on a high resolution camera payload. We were doing some work for uh, farm uh, uh, crop inspection. Yeah. 
Um, I'll let it go at that. I can't remember what I'm supposed to talk about or not, but I can talk about this. It's not going any further, but flying back, uh, one of the things that Easy Aerial is allowed to do with their drones is fly them out of line of sight. Because that's the trick. When you get certified and you get licensed, Part 107 licensing, so you can fly drones professionally and earn money for it, and that's the that's the environment that the Easy Aerial drones work in, yeah. you yep. have to maintain line of sight between the pilot, the remote pilot, and the drone. Huh. And if you don't have line of sight, you either have to get a waiver, you have to know your environment. There's a, there's a whole bunch of that's hoops you have to I thought fly the DJI through. drones had like multi-mile ranges. You... They're not, if, if you're using them to earn money, you have to keep, you have to be able to keep your eye on the drone. Huh. If you're flying by the drone camera, you have to get waivers and you've got to go through all sorts of. Who do you get a hoops. waiver from though? If you're like flying over a city. Uh, FAA. Oh, gotcha. Okay. There, are, there are ways to contact the FAA for dealing with drones to get these waivers. And you've got to give, in essence, a flight plan or, or something pretty much equivalent to that. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, the the easy aerial drones at that time did not have active obstacle avoidance. DJI's did. They had little either they had stereo camera setups or they had scanning laser systems, uh, which you can get hobbyist scanning laser systems for a hundred dollars. Uh, I don't know how good they are. We were just starting to look into that when when my tenure with easy aerial ended uh but yeah that that was they they were just starting to get into that but uh which would have been neat and would have kept two of my drones from crashing <laughs> <Brutal>. <laughs> yeah. it was brutal they just it's what like oh cool into? i think one crashed into power lines oh i gotcha which to, to be honest Detecting and avoiding power lines, even Pretty with a good system, yeah. is a challenge. Uh, the other one hit a tree. Yeah, that's fair. Okay, so you weren't it that high a, up, is what it sounds like. No, they they, they were returning from uh, not four. What is the word I'm looking for? For some reason, uh, I was under the impression eight. these were tethered drones, but I, I... They, they they can be. That's it. That's one of the interesting things. The drone in a box concept. You have a big blow molded plastic box with a with a two-part lid and the drone the rests case? uh similar to but uh a little bit of a coarser manufacturer okay. than a pelican case and it doesn't latch down the same way because it has to open and close on its own huh. so they've got a, a, a really nice an elegant four bar linkage electric actuators to open and close the doors so when the doors open the landing platform is revealed and you can, and then they have uh, again, like we were discussing earlier for the um, Blenheim Gilboa project. You have a long tether, a couple of hundred feet worth of line uh, with a slip ring, and it drives power and data to and from the drone. Uh, and the drone can launch with this. And you have drones that are permanently tethered. You have drones that can dump the tether, which is interesting. Oh, that is interesting. They, they, they just release a hook and the tether disconnects and drops and it has a parachute on the end of it huh. so it doesn't smack somebody in the head or crack itself up on a rock. Uh, and then the drone has onboard batteries and they allow it to fly free for 20, 30, 40 minutes or whatever. That's interesting. When, you have a pure, when you're under a tethered situation... So the tether just fly. provides power, not signal. Uh, it provides both. Oh. The tether provides power and signal. But if you have a, a hybrid drone, then it has to have wireless and it has to have battery. Yeah. But it's but you 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 don't have a drone that's all of a sudden becoming a hybrid. It's designed as a hybrid yeah, from the get go, or permanently tethered or non tethered. That's you know one of the well, first. I'm sure, the permanently parts. tethered ones have their own set of issues. Like I would imagine, like bearing fatigue or just you know like. Your motors would have to be designed for those duty cycles. I mean, if you kept it the motors like are eight force, hours, the, the, the winches are force sensitive. They they detect force. I forget exactly how, but they detect the force, and they balance the load on the tether. It they they don't 
I, w- I was thinking the motors driving the props. Like I would imagine that would be something that would overheat with. Yeah. Well, well the thing is when, once you're in the air for half an hour, which is your typical battery life. Yeah. And I don't, I don't want to besmirch easy aerial for all I know they can run for an hour. I just don't remember anymore. Uh, You've when, seen when, all there is to see and you don't have to be up there anymore. No, I, 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 <laughs> I, I, I don't like sitting in anybody's punch bowl. Uh, but once once you've reached a steady state with your motors and your bearings, yeah, th- then you're right. Then it's just a matter of, of fatigue. They they did have some heating issues. You put more fins on. The natural downdraft from the blades forces you know helps you cool your motors. Okay, that's it's interesting. Nice, you know, self fulfilling system, self correcting system. But you could as as long as you didn't burn out your bearings or burn up your motors. You could run twenty four seven on a tether. Cool. Yeah, well, I imagine the motor, the motors, and the bearings would be the the weak points. I mean, like it would be, it's. I would imagine most drone motors aren't rated for that type of duty cycle, and so I don't know what your failure point would be. But yeah, you know, I mean, a, a lot of these. I mean, the, the the drones that were part of my project would fly for between thirty five and forty five minutes. Somewhere online, I forget the 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 name of the website, there's a, a, a guy or a bunch of guys or guys and gals that went and put together a huge calculation website where you put in a dozen parameters and it will tell you how long your drone will fly. That's interesting. Uh, and uh, uh, Easy Aerial would use that site. They had they purchased the licenses for it. It's all above board. And it was fairly accurate. We we would use it as a, as a as the initial basis for our. So what's the limiting uh, reagent if not the battery life? So if you're running tethered, like what's what's the thing that keeps you from staying in the sky indefinitely? Probably bearings or motors. I would, I, I, I would think, but but it depends on what you. I mean, if if you need to run twenty four seven, maybe you're running for a week and then you ship the drone back to headquarters and you refurbish it. But yeah. you've just been able to do something that no one else has been able to do. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm. I admit it's cool. I'm just curious. Yeah. Well, one of the things they had really simple, a huge uh, high brightness LED panel yeah. hung from underneath the drone, and the uh, fire departments would buy them for like search so and rescue operations. Fire at night. If you're fighting a fire at night and you need to illuminate a section. Because let's say there's only smoke pouring out of it, and you don't have flames developed yet, and you need to illuminate a section of the roof where you need to start pouring water onto it. Normally, the fire departments would raise these huge masts with lights on the ends of the masts, and then they would add to the danger of the situation and the winds and the this and the that. A lot of weight, a lot of you know product that you'd have to bring around, and you could only get so high with a mast. But now they have these drones that can go up to 100, 150 feet or whatever on their tethers, turn and focus the light exactly where you want it, run on a tether so they could run it for six hours while they were putting out the fire. And it was a, it was a simple solution. And you'd, you'd bring your boxes with you, which are, you know, three foot on a side and two feet tall, as opposed to bringing some big old Asplund thing that you'd have to tow behind a a truck what's an ass blood uh if you've ever seen the big light units at the side of the highway well like a sign that's lighted no 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 they, they, they sell they, they have like four four lights on them oh uh, uh, yeah, yeah. like, the, the, like the street lights but for a highway yeah okay yeah and um an ass blend is one of the companies that does it, and uh, I'm trying to think of who else. Uh, lot, lots of companies will do that now. Uh, but yeah, this is an alternative to that. But again, if you're if you're lighting something at a highway, you maybe you, you've got the luxury of, of hauling out, you know, a, a 1,500 pound, 2,500 pound lighting unit with a gas engine in it and all the rest of it. But if you've got to get out to someplace quickly and only, and your setup is, you've, you've got to, you've got 15 minutes to mobilize. Yeah, you've, you've got only to be got to run for you know, like a couple hours or whatever. 
you just set these things up and you you have the your drones in the air and you fight your fires yeah that makes sense that's pretty cool Steve, uh, thanks for coming on. I've had a lot of fun uh, hanging out with you here tonight. Is there anything you want to plug on the tail end? Uh, well, I, I I plugged Show Motion. I <laughs> www.showmotion.com. I plug McLaren Engineering uh, and I plug Easy Aerial. Uh, I I think that's that's good for now. Uh, I should plug Renfield. The new movie with Nicolas Cage, because my son is in that one too. <laughs> if you watched any of our previous episodes, uh, Night so, is now streaming on Netflix. Uh, not yet, not yet. <laughs> but uh, I, I could barely see him. He he told me where to look for him. I could barely find him. So I watched the one, whole movie. You know, <laughs> we, can only, we can only hope that in the future he he gets uh, he he gets some more uh, notoriety in in film. Cool. Um, All right. Well, thanks for coming on. Let's do it again soon. All right. Very good. Good to see you, Spencer. Good to see you, Steve. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krause is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.